Today is February 20th, 2008, and we're at Elgin Academy, and I am interviewing Stanley Kulisa. Um, can you tell me the date of your birth? April 28, 1919. Okay, and um, I'm Abby McArdle and Nick Squinsky and Mr. Fleener. And we're working with Elgin Academy in the Gale Board and Public Library. Um, can you tell me, um, in the war, what branch of service you were in? World War II. And what were your what was your rank? A private first class, P of C. And where did you serve? Uh, first of all, I lived in Detroit, Michigan. I've been here uh, 23 years from Michigan, Illinois, and uh, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps and. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I joined the Marine Corps because others were joining the Navy. Incidentally, uh, in uh, right after Pearl Harbor, so many people were I enlisting, much more than the way it is now. And I joined the Marine Corps because maybe the Marine him or because it was the first to fight. Do you recall your first few days in service? Yes. Actually, we didn't go by airplanes, which you do now. We went by train from Detroit, Michigan, into San Diego for the boot camp. The boot camp, there were, the Marines have two boot camps, one in San Diego, California, and one in uh, South Carolina, Paris Island. So I went to uh, the one in San Diego. And the first thing I remember is that I thought it was going to be a picnic until I came in and all of us boots, and they call us boots incidentally, they're all standing up and a Marine comes in there, six foot lean, mean, and he used a lot of cuss words. <laughs> and he sounded out, it's loud and clear. He said, Marines can do anything, but the impossible takes a little longer. And look, when I'm looking at you people, I know it's going to take a little longer. A bunch of misfits, and that was the beginning. Um, so how'd you get through your boot camp? Pardon? How did you get through it? First of all, I learned to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> like, for instance, now, when they took us to the mess hall, and when they took us to the mess hall, they said, no talking. And, and there were 60 of us in the platoon. And someone said something. I didn't hear anybody. He says, you're not going to have no child down this morning because someone sounded off about face hoop. So we didn't eat no breakfast that day. And then we drilled. And we, and we drilled and drilled. We drilled for four hours. And then we would eat. And then we drilled for more hours. And the a couple of things I do remember when we eat. We're at attention. When they tell us, you can eat now, we had five minutes to eat. And if you don't eat it, you wear it. And i seen other Marines where the, the soup that he had, the DI, incidentally, we was, they were called, we had a sergeant and two corporals. And they were called DIs, drill instructors. And he took that soup and he just spilled it all over it. Do you know to this day, I always remember that. When I was in boot camp, and you do something wrong. You're always doing something wrong at the first. About a place, hoop! And I didn't hear that hoop. And I did the wrong turn. I would turn to the right, I turned to the left. The DI had a swagger stick. And I had a pit helmet. And then the pit helmet, you had two metal clips in there. And he whacked me over the pit helmet. And he, that's what he swore. And that pit helmet caught my ear. And that blood was oozing out. A lot of blood was coming down my cheek, my pants, all the way down. And I stood at attention. Do you know that he ignored it? He didn't even see that happen. I thought I would mention that. So we get on the... We're only in there, mostly from boot camp today or whatever. You go to 
see your family and so forth. But we didn't see no family. We got on the, on the ship and we went all the way, all the way. But because they don't tell us where you're going. You finally ended up in New Zealand. My division was the second division. And you have three teams. And they called the second regiment, the eighth regiment, and the sixth regiment. I was in the sixth regiment. So on August the 9th, the second regiment with the first uh, division, they went into Guadalcanal. That was a turning point because before that, the Japanese took all the different places, the Wake Islands, the Philippines, so forth. So Guadalcanal, when we went in there, we were the last ones to go to Guadalcanal. So when they started Guadalcanal on August the 6th, we didn't go there until January the 1st, 1943. And when we went in over there, we had to move fast, get off. And one of the hardest things to do is to go from the ship, from the top deck, a cargo net. And the cargo net moves. The Higgins boat moves on the bottom. So it's going, and you have to go at 80 pounds on your back. And then we, when we went into Wild Canal, we had to do it fast because the Japanese were going to one side of the island and we were going to the other side of the island. And we didn't want to fight the Japanese. We fought disease, filth. We had malaria, dinghy fever, and I can tell you that in the two months that I was there, the last two months, we secured the island, I lost 42 pounds. I was sweating so much that I lost about a gallon or two gallons of water every day. So the, the corpsmen, who happened to be the greatest people on earth, because they were the ones that would come out if you got wounded. Um, were there many casualties in your unit? Yes, a lot of casualties. There's a Marine dead and he's laying there. And, and in two days now, there's a million of maggots are now eating him. And I see that. And I tell my buddy, I said, if I get hit, please cover me up with some dirt because I don't want to see this of, of what I see this Marine with all those maggots, the whole body was full. That's what we had to put up. There were times I didn't eat because we got little can rations. That's all we ate. And when we ate, had that can rations, the flies were so many that the spoon and the, the little container was so much that I didn't eat. I ate only it was about 6 o'clock in the evening when the flies disappeared and the mosquitoes came in. And that's why we got malaria. And the thing is, when we got in the foxholes, there's a little safety there. Because if you get hit with a, with a bomb and it gets you in that there, then you're dead. But the thing is, if it hits somewhere else, that shrapnel, shrapnel is very hot. And the hot steel, and that's what, what kills a lot of individuals, There's a lot of wounded over there. At night, you never sleep. Sometimes they will say, tonight it will be 50% watch. So someone, you, you have two in a foxhole. When you have those two in a foxhole over there, and it's dark now, from the left someone says, zero one hundred. And you pass this on, zero, one hundred. And that's all you say, because the Japanese are all around you. And that one night, when I said that, 1,002, or zero, three hundred, there was no answer. In the morning, we found out. That foxhole, just a few feet away from me, were two Marines. They were dead. Their throats were cut. So then, when, when Guadalcanal, we all, we moved up, in Europe, when we finally got the chance, when we were back to New Zealand, we looked at a newspaper, fighting the Germans, the army fighting our, the Germans over there, 
Patsy would make 200 miles in one day. You know what we made? A thousand yards. We were fighting by yards. So we left Guadalcanal. When we left Guadalcanal, one of the worst things I felt, I took a bath, showers. And I got to mention this, in New Zealand, when we were there, oh, it was a beautiful country. Just a half a block away was a river. And that river had a sheet of little ice. And the reason I mention this, when I'm going back now to where I'm at, outside I'm taking a shower. It's cold. So you, so when you take a shower, you go underneath the water, you get wet. When you get wet, you come out and you lather yourself up and you go back again, you get wet again. And the main reason I'm doing that is because of smell. The worst smell on earth I found out is a human being that's dead. It was a Japanese, it was a Marine that's dead. The smell, again, and then I found out that although I washed myself, took three baths in one day in New Zealand, I still could smell it. It took a long time to get over it. And after six months, they put us aboard ship. So when we're going, we know we're going somewhere else. And here it is. Guess what? We thought the 6th Regiment, because the 2nd Regiment was on Guadalcanal first, the 8th Regiment was there, and we were the last. So we thought for sure that we're going to take this. It's only a mile long by a few yards. But if you see the white part of it is, that's, the, that's what we're fighting for, the airport. So guess what? We did not go in. We were informed. Somehow I kept kind of, probably kind of bad because they said, it'll only take one day to take it. We could take that in one day. So guess what? Is there was a second regiment and an eighth regiment, and I didn't go in there until the following day, 1800. That was military time. That's six o'clock. The D-Day won. A thousand Marines were killed that first day. They lost communications. There were no tanks. There were no artillery. So, it, so there was hand to hand. So they were killed each other. So what happened? The half tracks, uh, the alligators, they were, had only half of them. And half the Higgins boats. So when the Higgins boats opened up, and the Marines, 50 of them, Marines went in there, and all good swimmers. But guess what? They all drowned. Why? Because they couldn't take this off. So finally, on the second day when we went in, the Japanese started the guns attack because there was 500 pillboxes. And the Navy failed to knock those pillboxes. They were sure they were bombing that, but they were not knocking them out. Then finally, 76 hours, 76 hours, that's only three days and four hours, we secured it, we put the flag up. And the smell is so gross that with the CB, CB is the engineering outfit that's a is part of the Navy. They come out with these big bulldozers. They had to, when they're scooping up the Japanese, they're also scooping up the Marines together, pile them up. And airplanes for the, from the hell, from the carrier comes, makes the first landing. When he first makes the landing, he's, he reported at 3,000 feet. He, the smell is so much as he's vomiting. Why? The smell of this island. So then after Tarawa, we traveled 2,000 miles to, to the big paradise, Pearl Harbor. And that was quite a sight because we got there two years before is when Pearl Harbor was hit. So all those ships were still there. We see the, uh, the destruction what the Japanese did to us. And then we finally left over there. After we dropped the wounded, we come to the big island of Hawaii. And oh, it's so beautiful. Palm trees and all beautiful weather and all that. Then they put us on trucks. As we go into the trucks, 
and we go 80 miles. When we go to 80 miles, you know what we find out? We're cold. Because that, because they're putting us over where they used to, a couple of volcanoes that were diminished. And then they stopped, and they said, this is our camp. Because they call, we call it Camp Tarawa. So we're trying to get clothes. We're trying to get jackets. We're, we were sweating like pigs over there, but now we're freezing. But we're, we're, we're Marines, though, so we're used to the cold. We're used to the hot. So we stayed there six months, and we did a lot of things. What One thing, how we found out that whatever we're going to go, what we're going to do, they're going to be, they're going to be civilians. So they made up an area over there. So as we're progressing with our rifles and shooting, a silhouette would come up. It would be a, would be a, a civilian. It would be a Jap. So you make sure you shoot at a Jap, you don't shoot at a civilian. After this year, six months over there, they put us aboard ship, and then they don't tell us until finally they tell us, Saipan. We're going to Saipan. The 6th Regiment, my regiment, will be in an assault wave that first day. And I'm going to be in the 5th wave. So the first wave went in there, then the second wave, and then the third. But at the 4th wave, the Japanese start shooting at them. And I'm in the 5th wave. So finally, as I get, we start getting in there, there are two, they hit us with two shells. So now we're on fire. And, this, and there's a Marine next to me over here. And his head's blown off, and his head's blown off full of blood. <laughs> I'm so blown with blood. First of all, I thought I was hit. So then we said, let's get out. So here, we learned something from Tarawa. Well, I just took this, whoosh, that's off. I took my cartridge bow with my ammunition, whoosh, over, took my helmet off, took my shoes off, and oh, in the water. And, and while we're in the water, some are dead, some are wounded over there. And, and the, 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 the lieutenant is with us over there. And he said, I am not going to tell you what you should do. Should you wait for some Amtrak to take you back to the ship? Or do you want to walk in? One of the, th one of the things is, as you take a look at that picture, they have what they call colored beaches. Number one, number two, number three. Well, we were landing, scheduled to land number three, which means there were Japanese to the left. That's their territory. So these individuals that decided to go in, they were all dead. And we stayed there about three or four hours. Finally, we got to the ship. But now on the ship, what is it? I don't have no, uh, my, I'm bleeding a little from my, from the coral reefs and the, and what, well, and, and the, the snipers are trying to get us, bing, bing, the bullets are going off, so we just got to keep away from each other. So when we get aboard ship, this here, what we find, the whole place is littered with Marines, all the wounded. And then, so I, first of all, the corpsman looks at my feet, puts a little, the sear on there, and then the first thing I look for, a, uh, this Marine is that, uh, what size of shoes are there, Mac? And so I would get his shoes. I would go to get a helmet. I'd get a rifle, and I would tell him, well, what's your, because he all rifles fire a little different. So, so that's how we got our equipment. And when we got it, oh, yeah, and then for some other, I wanted to go to the mess hall. I wanted to go in the mess hall and, and, uh, and get a drink or something. Then I seen that the mess hall is now a surgery. And then I look over here, two buckets, they got legs and arms in that buckets. That's the only time I ever sit there when I see the Civil War movie. So anyway, yeah, but don't forget we're Marines. We're happy that I'm still alive. And guess what? I was happy that when I got all the equipment, the following day we went in again. And we were there for 30 days. And after 30 days, we secured the island. But the island of Tinian is three miles away. Normally, we would go for six months. The rest periods, 
recuperate, replace the wounded, replace the dead. We had Tarawa with 1,000. We lost 4,000 dead and 14,000 wounded on, on Saipan. So we're also beat up. We're with this, with the, we're with this second division, the army's in the middle, and the fourth division. And then finally, they decided that we're at Tinian, three miles away from us. The eighth regiment and the second regiment is making a landing in that nice beach at Tinian over there. And the Japanese are firing on it. Then they turn around and going out. And the Japanese are so happy that their admiral calls Tokyo and tells them, hey, the Marines, the Marines retreated. But while they're doing that, we're coming in. If you look at that map, we're coming in from the other side. In nine days, we took Tinian. And one more thing I did, I omitted. When we finally, we were fighting on Saipan, before we were in the Tinian, we finally got to the North Island. And then I seen with my own eyes is that a father and mother, the Japanese civilian, he would have a little kid. He'd take that kid and threw it on the rocks over the cliffs. And then he would hold hands. They would jump. We found out we lost 20, they lost 22,000 civilians were killed on Saipan. And then one thing you've know, you got to mention about Tinye is is that the Army Air Force came into Saipan and Tinian. Now, every day, they go and bombing them. And so finally, when we left Tinian, after we secured it, we went back to Saipan, and we come as a, as a company, because before, we, in, in, in combat, regimental weapons didn't go in the combat as a company. It went as a platoon. So finally, we lost so many men on Saipan, and after being in that water zone, that the lieutenant got us together because the third platoon lost us, so we, then we call ourselves the second, third battalion, a second platoon. Not the second platoon, it's second slash third platoon, because we lost 60 individuals, either dead or wounded. So, on the, November 1st, it was wonderful. You know what was wonderful? On the bulletin board, they put up their all privates and PFCs will be going home. So my friends are sergeants, corporals, and they said, well, we want to go home too. Because they said, anyone that has four islands, Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Saipan and Tinian will be going home. So on November 1st, 1944, uh, this is 44, the war's not over yet, we'll be going home. So when we got, finally we ended up at Pearl Harbor, and from Pearl Harbor we got home. They, they told us that we have a, we have three weeks, we can go home, and then we'll end up in North Carolina. So I went home, and then my sister said, aren't you going to uh, thank your uh, the Virginia over there on the next block? Beautiful girl over there. I, I thought I would never have a chance with her because she was so pretty and so forth. So I fell in love with her when I was 10 years old, but I didn't have the nerve to talk to her. But here he is. <laughs> I'm walking that block to, to thank her, and guess what? When I walk in there and look through the window, there are two nuns over there. Because in nowadays you can't see the nuns, but now then they had a habit on. So when I opened the door, she opened the door, I said, I was in hell, now I'm in heaven. <laughs> and so I got my 38th Pontiac. Don't forget, this is in 44. I got my 38th Pontiac drove up to the house and took the two nuns to the cluster where they was here. And, and guess what? My wife was signing up to be a nun. But in 10 days, we were engaged. So then I left for North Carolina. Well, I'm there in North Carolina in April, 
And I'm glad she didn't give me one of those Dear John letters. She said, I want to meet you. So we don't forget, she lived in Detroit and I'm in North Carolina. So we met in Washington, D.C. And as we're walking in Washington, D.C., she takes the ring off. She said, I want to give you the ring because I still want to be a nun. So what I said to her, if it was another man, I would fight for you, for your head. But since it's God, I will step aside. So I said, you keep the ring because I will not give it to no one else. So I went to North Carolina, stayed there six months, and then I got a physical. I got news for you. I was hoping I wouldn't pass, but they did pass me, and then they sent me over to, back to, on a train, back to California over there, and I was going to, the, this is beginning to be August now, and I'm going, I'm going to be this year, a replacement battalion because on November 1st, in 1945, now we only had two divisions at the start. Now we got six Marine divisions and the Army secured Germany in May. And this November 1st, we'll go uh, and hit this here uh, Tokyo. But before that, on August the 6th and August the 9th, that B-29 took off from that Tinya, that that what we did from the they took off to those atomic bombs. To this day, some people say they shouldn't have done that. To me, they should have dropped ten of them, not on the civilians, on the people, because what they did to Pearl Harbor. Look, the three thousand people in Arizona was so many that they just buried them in there. So. So anyway, when the war was over, my wife, well, I said my wife, she met me at the airport, at the depot, there was no airplanes. So they took a train and then we took a streetcar. What, do you know what a streetcar is? You know, you pay six cents <laughs> those things. And they took us home. And then she told me, she gave me the good news. She said, I'm gonna marry you because the nuns told me that uh, you're going to have five daughters. They're all going to be nuns. And, and, and this year. So I forgot. I didn't. I, that was in 1946. So what I said, I had a nice pistol over there for the Japanese. If you would, I gave that away. I gave my rifle away. And when I worked at General Motors, some individuals asked me to go hunting with them for deer. And I said, no, I don't have no rifle. But that's not the reason. I didn't want to kill even the deer. I feel a whole lot of killing. What does freedom mean to you? What does freedom mean to me? Well, I'd, I'd like to give you an example. I'm going back when I was a teenager. I went to school. Oh, incidentally, now you go, you drive certain areas, the parking lot, some parking lots got a thousand cars. They're all students. That's all. The, in my time, no one had a car. No one had a car. So we all walked. Then we had a. So when we walked to school, and I didn't have no fear like it is now. I. It was so nice just to walk to school and walk back. So that's 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 the freedom I have. That it, it, I, I didn't experience no hardship like you people now. The, everything. It, it, in other words, what they said it was the greatest generation. At first, I didn't believe that, but I thought what I lived through was better than it what it is today. Yes. Okay. Is is that okay?